In 2006, I decided to leave Hong Kong, where I had been living and working for years, and go back home to England. I wanted to do the journey slowly overland, so I took unpaid leave from work and set off by bike. After about a week on the road, I had crossed Guangdong and reached Wuzhou on the border with the next province. I was doing the ride alone, but for the last couple of days, I'd not been alone actually, I'd had the company of a gang of cycling friends from Hong Kong. They'd driven out to ride with me for a long weekend as a last send off. <laughs> but now they'd gone and suddenly I felt really alone and vulnerable. My last lifeline had gone and whatever happened now, I'd have to sort it out for myself. And on the map, the province that I had done, which was Guangdong, looked really crowded compared to Guangxi, the region I was now going to cross, which looked much emptier. I had no real idea how hard it would be and no idea how I'd find places to stay, actually, as the Chinese hotel website I'd been using showed no accommodation outside the cities, such as Guilin, the big city that I was aiming for next, which was three or four days' ride away. But it was exciting. I bought some biscuits and I set off. And as soon as I was on the way, I found that I loved the solitude and I didn't feel lonely at all. I met a Spanish cyclist actually, who was heading for Hong Kong and who had no idea how far it was and who didn't speak any Chinese. He had proper worn bags having ridden all the way from Spain and I felt really conscious of my shiny new panniers having only just set off. But it felt good to be able to say, oh, it's about a week to Hong Kong from here. I felt really good about saying that, measuring the distance in cycling days. I wondered how many long distance cyclists I'd meet actually on the way. Like, were there hundreds of them that I would meet all the time? But, in fact, over the whole six months that I was on the road, I met only nine more. That brief chat with the Spanish cyclist did me good, actually, because it made me think, if he can do it, then so can I. I could hear the people in the paddy fields and the vegetable plots talking to each other and I could hear bird song across the fields and the hills. I was really enjoying Guangxi. It was beautiful. The counties I went through though were where some of the absolute worst violence happened in the Cultural Revolution in the late 1960s with hundreds of people, even children, killed out here in the countryside. It's just awful to think that the people I met of my age and older had come through that. I came to a scrappy little town piled with old bricks and rubbish and had no idea where I'd stay, but I managed to find a little guest house. You needed a stick to turn on the light, which had to be poked to make it go on, but it was fine. And the following day, I rode on through the rice fields. I pulled over in a small place where they had yo chow fried dough strips and hot soybean milk, which I'm really keen on for breakfast. I chatted with a couple. She was local and he had moved here from Taishan back on the coast. They watched over my bike while I went to the toilet. This was how I had to be, travelling alone, finding nice people, enjoying their company and trusting them to help me. In the villages, I saw how village shops sold pretty much everything people needed to buy. And it was interesting to see what you actually do need. Basically, red plastic brushes, big bags of toilet paper rolls, plastic tubs, plastic buckets, rope, umbrellas, shampoo, which was sold in sachets, household chemicals, big metal pans, trays of cigarettes, and rice. I arrived in the town of Mengshan and looked for a place to stay. I used a new method I had thought of, basically spying out a smartly dressed woman and then asking her which was the best hotel in town. It worked perfectly. 
I'm sitting on a balcony overlooking the River Mung and I'm looking out at the very fancy bridge. There's a huge old tree bending down towards the water and there's birds singing, sometimes dogs barking, some people banging something but it's very peaceful and you can even hear the creak of bicycles going by. But huge things have happened in this little town, actually. In summer 1851, it was totally not peaceful, but packed with refugees who were fleeing an army of rebels that was marching across the countryside. The rebels were poor people, armed with wooden spears and gunpowder stuffed into bamboo tubes. After dark, one Thursday evening in September 1851, the rebels attacked, using shields made from coffins, bizarrely. And rebel agents who'd been hiding here in town set buildings on fire to create panic. The government's troops fled, and this little place became the first town that the rebels took. It became known as the Taipings, and their rebellion grew into a gigantic civil war in which over 20 million people died. The whole thing started just a few miles away in an area called Thistle Mountain. The people there were inspired to rebel by a man who'd read a bit about Christianity and who one night had had a dream that he was the younger brother of Jesus and he decided he'd create a heavenly kingdom of God worshippers on earth. For work a few years ago I went to find the villages of the very first God worshippers for a TV documentary film. The rebellion was super famous so you would imagine these places would be well known but the thing is, almost no one had actually gone to try and find where the rebellion really began. Even the locals weren't sure where the villages were. It took a lot of questions and answers and a bit of motorbike riding. But I did find them and the whole story was amazing. This was where one of the leaders worked as a cowherd right at the beginning when he was down on his luck and the movement had no followers at all. The family who employed him still live here. This is the tree where the leader preached. And this is where the family then built a church. It's gone now, they said. This is where the leader then went to work as a teacher, believe it or not. And the family here also became keen God worshippers. The same family still live there now. This is the village where the first conflict occurred between the growing band of God worshippers and local landowners. The same family still live here now. This is the house where the leaders hid. It was run down and locked up. And then I went to find the hill, which is known as God's Hill, where in July 1850 the Taiping army declared their uprising. It was fantastic to walk into these muddy little places and talk to people whose great-great-grandparents had played a role in a massive event in China's history. And it was lovely to see how happy and proud these people were that someone came and cared and knew their story. I ate the last chocolate digestive biscuits that I brought from Hong Kong. Sad! All these last things were like a long goodbye to the place that had been my home. But no, not sad. I enjoyed them. And then they were gone. And then I would enjoy whatever came next. The next day, it tipped with rain. I slogged past wet fields in grey light. I got my first puncture. I am no great mechanic, but I can handle all the usual things that go wrong. And a puncture was no big deal. But when I tried to put my brilliant armadillo tyre back onto the rim, I found it was really tight. 
like super duper tight. I had a massive struggle, but I could not be mountain tired. My hands got really tired and really sore and I still couldn't do it. And I was making things worse actually, getting dirt and grit everywhere. This was a disaster. I was in the open road in heavy rain in the middle of nowhere, wet and getting cold with my bags all over the road and the bike unrivaled. There were mud cottages about a field's distance away and a man walked by actually, but I just smiled as if I was fine because I didn't want her to show that I was in trouble and look vulnerable. In desperation, I pulled out my spare tyre and tried it. It was a looser fit and thank God I managed to get it onto the rim. The whole situation was super worrying, but at least I was going again for now. And through the rain, I started to see spectacular pinnacles and spires for which this area is famous. It was super exciting. Then suddenly I was in Yangshuo town. It's a holiday resort. There are tons of shops and cafes selling things for foreigners, which all seems very strange after the hills and countryside where there's nothing like this at all. But once I got used to it, I really enjoyed Yang Shuo. I had French toast and coffee at one cafe, and then eggs and potato rusty at another, and apple pie and custard at another, and I talked to other foreigners, and I listened to live bands. I'm out in the street with about 50 million other people, mostly mainland Chinese, but tons of foreigners as well. It was definitely strange, but I enjoyed it. I bought another spare tyre too. The shop hardly had any 700 Cs, but I bought a soft plastic one that was the best they had and felt relieved that now I had another tyre that hopefully I could get on the rims if I needed to keep me on the road. I was aiming to reach Guilin. I thought instead of the main road, I would take some little roads on the other side of the river. My map had new contours, so I had no idea about the terrain. The rain had gone and I loved it. After a village called Xinping, the road became a track. Motorbikes were lurching along and tractors bashing into cattle. There were lots of small villages and lots of people. The land rose gradually. As I climbed, the people and the traffic Got less. And there were gorgeous views of blue pinnacles, as tall as the skyscrapers in Hong Kong. Wednesday the 19th of April and I'm on a track in between Yangshuo and Guilin. In front of me are the cast limestone hills. Quite a long way to go. I'd better keep going towards Guilin. The road went up and up. Because my map had no contours I had no idea that I would be climbing like this and I wasn't really prepared for it. I didn't have enough water with me and it was boiling hot. It felt sort of steamy behind my shades. I was spinning my water out, hoping I would find somewhere where I could get some. Once I thought, oh God, I must have gone wrong because I could see a fork a long way below and I thought, oh, maybe I should have taken it. So I waited for ages until someone came by so that I could ask them if I was on the right road. Finally, I reached the top.
I descended and eventually came to a little shop. There was an old woman on one side of the door and an old man on the other. The woman had gold earrings and despite the heat was wearing a knitted hat and furry boots. There was no one else around. The woman brought me a small wooden chair and I drank a litre of delicious water. A younger man walked over with his child. He proudly said his child was naughty and goes all over the place. The child in its squeaky shoes was eventually brave enough to touch me and then tried to eat some cotton thread he found and then his father scolded him in a pleased and kind way. Most of the villagers still work on the land, the young man said. A few have gone to Guangdong to find work, but not many, and none to Shanghai and none to Beijing. He said he'd been to Shanghai once. Would he go back? I asked. No, he said. The clock chimed 2.30 in the back of the shop. I still had a long way to go and I rolled on downhill. Where the land became flatter, I came to a large old building at the roadside. The sign said, Bai Clan Ancestral Hall. These halls are a sort of a cross between a shrine and a social centre. I went in. Two men were mending a bicycle in the dust. In the farthest room, old people were playing cards. I asked if there was anyone called Bai around here anymore. They looked at me as if I was stupid and said, yes, everyone, which is how it is in these clan villages. They said the hall was 200 years old. I heard children chanting something in a room at the side and a strawberry seller further along said that the Bais are a Muslim clan. So interesting. But I went on to a town called Dashu. I followed signs for the old town. I'm in Dashu on Wednesday afternoon at 4pm. There's an ancient street cobbled with one or one and a half storey houses on either side with wooden fronts and stone seats outside. And there's someone singing. dog just walked by. I talked to some women sitting outside their door. Did they like the houses, I asked. No, we don't like these old houses, they said. The grannies offered me shanja cha or fruit tea. Where's your bottle, they said. Everyone should carry a bottle, of course. It reminded me of living in China in the 1990s, carrying an old Nescafe jar everywhere, which strangers would gladly fill with hot water. These kindnesses and courtesies to strangers were so nice. It was very nice, but I was really tired and it was still 20 kilometres to the city of Guilin. The road became a six lane concrete highway. I rolled along in whizzing traffic, reaching Guilin at dusk. Now I was really hungry. I saw a pancake seller and suddenly absolutely wanted a pancake. Swerved, hit a stone bollard, fell off and broke my leg. A skinny young woman picked me up and straightened up the bollard amazingly. And that was how I reached Guilin, my first major Chinese city. I finally found a place to stay and patched up my grace.